That's it, buddy. So three, two, one. Hello, everybody. My name is Juan Carlos, and welcome to OCR and Edited, where we highlight amazing coaches, athletes, and everyday people from the OCR and trail communities for fun, unscripted, and unedited conversations. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with athlete, runner, founder, and president, or I should say, slash CEO of Athletics. Now, is it Troy Boussault? Now, Troy, do I say your last name right? You did. You nailed it, Boussault, yes. Uh, now, Boussault, is that French? It's it's actually Basque, although there is a Busso, Spain. There is a little town in Spain called Busso. So, um, yeah, I think my dad actually he was I think through the first um, fifteen or so years of his life he was Busat. In uh, he grew up in in uh, Key West in Florida. So okay. that side of the family is all Cuban. So my grandparents um, came over from Cuba. <clears throat> yeah, look at that. Indeed, and so they uh, he went by Busat. And then an uncle went over to Spain on vacation and like wandered into this very small town <laughs> called Busso and they pronounced yeah. it Busso. So he came back and said, Hey, we, we've been pronouncing our name wrong this whole time. So then they changed it to Busso. So, yeah. Now I didn't know that. I yeah. mean, I'm Spanish. I was born in Canada, but I was okay. raised in Ecuador. My mom's from Colombia. Mm. Um, yeah, buddy, I didn't know that you had Cuban in you. Do yeah, you speak indeed. Spanish? No, you know, and the funny <laughs> thing is I grew up in, my folks divorced when I was um, less than a year old. And so yeah. my mom took us to Phoenix where her family was. A yeah. couple of, there was a circuitous route in there, but I'll skip some gory details. We ended up in Phoenix. And so I would spend my summers with my dad in Miami. Okay. Um, and so I would, I would sort of like build up a level of Spanish and then lose it all, you know, for 11 months out of the year. And <laughs> in high school, it got a little better because I took four years of Spanish and, you know, I could, I could, I could find the bathroom if I were in Mexico, but that's, <laughs> that's about it <laughs> these days. Oh, buddy. Well put. Yeah. So, yeah. you know what, Troy, it, you know, welcome to OCR Net Edit, and thank you for making the time to speak with me today. It truly is a pleasure. And, uh, you know, first thing is first, the one thing that I want to know, and everybody that's listening and watching want to know is, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Troy Busso? <clears throat> oh, geez. <clears throat> well, um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, Loaded certainly puts me on the spot. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think in, in its most simple terms is, um, you know, I grew up athletic as a more traditional athlete, football, baseball, wrestling, um, got into endurance sports much, much later. Um, I, I kind of straddled the lines as a young man, as a, you know, quote unquote jock and musician. And so I, after high school, I went the music route, played in some bands and things around uh, wow. uh, Tempe and the, kind of the height of the, Tempe used to have a really hot music scene. A lot of guys came over from, from LA. And so there was, this is kind of like the gin blossoms, feed bags days, gotcha. ended up getting pretty famous from our backyard. Um, yeah. And, and, and then during that time, sort of, I came to programming in the whole world of computers from the artistic side. So I went from music, I was dating a girl who was a photographer, got into that, we had a dark room. Um, and then the first time I saw a, a photograph on a computer screen, I was like, just hooked. I was just fascinated by that. So I, I took up graphic design and, and then just sort of over the years learned how to program. And then one day had this idea for, for Athlinks, which was, it was actually called Virtue Race First. And, and it was actually, oddly, um, I just had um, Jason Hardrath and Ashley Winchester on uh, the Athlinks podcast, The King and Queen of FKTs. Okay. And I realized Virtue Race was really this FKT engine 20 years ago. And the idea was that you'd go and put these, these known routes, basically, and okay. then everybody would just go put in their times and you know upload photos and stuff. Um, and at the time, it was a miserable idea. Nobody understood it, and I couldn't explain it to people. And and it it existed like that for about two months, and um, and then I uh, I slowly realized like there was no great place on the internet to just go find all of your race results in one place. So I tweaked the formula a little bit with Virtue Race. Um, started uploading results into it, and uh, it sort of caught fire pretty quickly there. And uh, 
and then renamed it to Athlinks about two years later. I couldn't find a better name. I hated the name Virtue Race at that time, uh, but I couldn't think of a better name. And uh, I know, just, yeah, yeah, it's tough to name. I know that is very true. Yeah, and Athlinks just fits it. it. It works. Yeah. Oh man, it's such a great name. Yeah. <laughs> now, of all the sports that you could have done, you know, participated, competed in, yeah, why running? What is it about running that caught your attention? Yeah, so the easy answer is I was always fast as a kid. I was a fast sprinter, and I loved running. Like, I, I've interviewed a lot of people and spoken with a lot of people that all say the same thing, that, like, running was punishment. I loved it. I, I absolutely loved, um, like, I would run to and from school. I would run everywhere. And um, I was never, like, a good distance runner, but I was a fast sprinter, um, you know, for a, a, a short, uh, you know, a short kid from Scottsdale, Arizona, I was fast for my surroundings. I was always one of the, you know, two or three fastest kids in my grade or school or whatever. So I just always loved it. And then it was always interesting because I would, I would sort of float back and forth between this football style of running. And then your next season is wrestling. So football, you gain as much weight as possible. You know, you, you sprint, everything's a sprint. You're never running more than 40 yards at a time type of type of running. And then immediately at the end of football season, then you shift into this wrestling mindset, which is long, slow, weight loss, build that endurance engine as much as you can um, and throw some anaerobic, you know, more interval style things in there to get through the two minute periods. But yeah, I just, I just always loved it, but I never got into the race scene. And I think like you're always limited mentally by things. And so because I wasn't on the cross country team, like I just thought that, you know, running 5Ks or marathons or anything was just beyond anything that I would do. I didn't understand at the time. So this would have been like the late 80s, early 90s. I didn't understand that people just showed up to race, not to win. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. And so I was always like, well, you know, I knew some kids in my grade who were running, you know, sub five minute miles. And yeah, I don't remember what my time was. Let's say I ran a 5:30 at the time, and I was like, "Well, that's not going to get it done. So why go race?" You know, it just never occurred to me. Yeah. So, yeah, what's, it's kind of an interesting thing. What's interesting is that you did wrestling, and so did I. What got you into wrestling? Um, God, that's a good question too. It was funny because I grew up with you know like a single mom, but an older brother, and so he and I would just beat the hell out of each other, <laughs> you know. And it you was me both. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a, I mean, it was a great thing. We, you know, we get along great now, but I mean, I, when I say beat the hell, it wasn't like a, you know, a brotherly love kind of thing. We would beat the hell out of each other. And he's a, he's a bigger guy. He's, he's built very different from me. He's like yeah. more like Fred Flintstone. He's a real strong guy, <laughs> super fast. Like he was a really good sprinter for his size, especially. Yeah. Um, and so when he would get his, his shit moving in a direction, man, it was like, Get out, out of the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I just had a big mouth and a sarcastic little <laughs> shit. So I would push his buttons. <laughs> but I just, you know, I loved it. And there was a, uh, there used to, I think it still exists, but there was a, a program at the time called Sunkissed Kids. And it was like junior AAU wrestling. And, um, and it just happened that the, the high school in the neighborhood that we were all going to had a good little theater sort of uh, developmental program. Yeah. And so I went to like a handful of practices and liked it. And then I found out that, okay, I have a, an aptitude for this, you know, but I didn't really take it seriously until I got, well, I guess in about eighth grade is when I started learning how to do it and actually, you know, like not just beating my friends up or whatever. It was just actually starting to learn the discipline of wrestling. And then it was just, you know, I couldn't play basketball. I really, I always prided myself on being very athletic, but I could not play basketball for the life of me. I tried out for the junior high team and (laughs) it was like, uh, no, I think I made it to the first day of tryouts. And even the coach was like, you're not good. (laughs) You are not good at this. I was good at defense. Like I could, I could get on someone like glue and lock them down, but I just sucked at, at, uh, shooting and passing. Yeah. I love it. Now, what would you consider yourself to be a short distance runner or a long distance runner? Well, I mean, I'm 49 now, so I think I'm I'm slowly making that transition uh, to longer. So I'm training for Silver Rush, which is a 50 miler up in Leadville, Colorado, in in uh, in the summer. Um, 
Yeah, I, you know, I don't know that I consider myself anything necessarily. I really, I just love doing, and nice. sometimes at, at times I love doing shorter 5k types of efforts. And yeah. sometimes I, sometimes I just don't feel like going intense for a long time. And so just going for three or four or five hours just feels better. You know, you just never know. Yeah. Now, what do you prefer road or trail? Only trail. Yeah. I, I hate road running. Thank you. <laughs> don't yeah. get me wrong for everybody listening and watching i love road you know it helps me mm -hmm. and w with my training and all but yeah. trail is my thing that's my shit yeah well it's funny because i you know like i don't know if everybody is like this and it doesn't i've i've tried hokas and and different things yeah uh, different shoes different levels of cushioning i can i there is a noticeable and i mean noticeable difference going from like a concrete sidewalk even to an asphalt, like I'll run in the bike lane, I can tell a world of difference just in the yes. difference between concrete and asphalt. And then when I get to the trails, and again, maybe it's just at 49, I, I, my body just, I feel like if I run on, on concrete, I just feel it. Like I, you know, I can, I can, I can run maybe 60% as far if I'm on hard surfaces than trails. Funny thing you say that. Some people, well, people that I know, we talked about this. And even for myself, I can tell the difference. And sometimes my body has, to, I can feel my boss, my, my boss, my body readjust <laughs> its technique. Your body is your boss. Well, yeah, you got a point there. <laughs> and, it, and, I can, and I can feel the technique yeah. or mechanics change in order to suit a concrete. Because yeah. I can feel the concrete so much it pounds your, 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 your joints. And I can feel that. But when, like you said, asphalt and trail is a whole different game. Yeah. And it's amazing how the mechanics of your body changes when you're running. Yeah. Truly yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. And I, like when I first start getting, you know, cause I'll, especially since moving to Colorado, I've admittedly gotten, I'll get a little out of shape in the winter time and then I'll, I'll kick it back in in spring. And it's easier to start on like treadmills or, or that asphalt, that bike lane, because you're, you're like, my core isn't where it needs to be. Yeah. And so I have noticed when I'm doing, especially more technical trails, uneven ground, rocky stuff. If I'm not ready for that, I have to really be careful because I'll just get, you know, I mean, the level of fatigue when your body, you know, your core, you're getting, you're getting twisted around as you're running. Those types of things are, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, and but those are some of the things that you also need to train in order to be, uh, to be successful and to have that longevity. Yeah, yeah. I've done. I've, I've, I've moved toward. I rarely lift weights at this point anymore. I've, I've gone to a lot of like elastic bands. And yes. a lot of functional stuff, a lot of rotation and, and things that I've noticed a massive, massive difference in that. I agree. Uh, movement. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, what are some of your best races and finishes? <laughs> um, oh God, that's a good question. Yeah, again, I, like I've never been great. I, I, I podiumed at a triathlon, a pretty big triathlon. It was called Soma. Oh. Um, it was oh. a, yeah, it was a, um, it was kind of a weird one. It was a, it was a, half iron and quarter man. So it was sort of like a modified Olympic. Um, wow. Yeah, it was a weird, um, it, it was a race in Tempe. Uh, Red Rocks used to own it. It was a great race, fun race, big triathlon. Um, and it was like right at the end of my first real full triathlon season. And it was one where all that periodization, all that training, it just clicked on the last race of the season. It just worked perfectly at a seasonal level. Yeah. Um, and so like, I think I took, uh, I think I was second in my age group or something like that. That was probably my best triathlon finish. Um, and I was, you know, like for me, it was fast. I was never a good cyclist, but you know, it was like 10th out of the water or something like, I don't know, the results are on athletics. I should just look them up, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, that was cause like, I, like I took second in a 5k a few years back. It was like the superhero run, but it was yeah. like, I'm not a guy you ever want taking second place in your 5k. It means no one showed up, you know? So it was a field of like a couple hundred people, but nobody fast was there. Um, wow. That's the, that is truly funny. You know what? I, I love, I would love to do a triathlon, but I can't yeah. my swimming. I don't have that, that swimming strength. And I guess for me, the, what, what scares me the most is about is, I can go and swim for a bit. Not a problem. I can swim. It's just where there's a, a, a large group of 
people gathered yeah. together and they're all going at the same time the yeah. panic attack in my mind starts to yeah. set in what if somebody hits me in the head with their foot or yeah. grabs my head and brings me down water those are some of the things that make me just you know what i don't think triathlon is for me i'll stick to duathlon well, I think you got to try it is the, is the answer. It, it just, you know, I, I mean, like, I can't believe I just heard you say, I can't do it. You know? I know, you know, because you can do it and it does require, um, it, and I learned this the hard way, not the hard way, but I learned it the hard way of, uh, you just have to focus and decide. It's not like the bike on the bike. You have to look out for other people. You have to yeah. Be very conscious, right? You have to. So the focus on the bike is, I mean, less so in a triathlon because there's no drafting, but on the bike, when you're riding in a group, the key is focus, focus on the other riders. Yep. This open water swim is the exact opposite. Key to open water swim is only focus on yourself. And when you're getting punched in the face or when you've got somebody who is panicking and, and pulling on you, you just have to focus on yourself, swim harder, pull away, you know, just dig deeper and just get through that thing. Because the second you break your rhythm and you start worrying about someone else, that's when, you know, you're going to vapor lock your, you know, all that lactic acid is going to settle into your tri triceps. And, you know, you're going to be like, oh shit, now I'm, now I'm stranded out in the middle of the water. You, you know, you made a good point and it's true because somebody told me the same thing is, and they said that you can do it, just go do it on your own. Yeah and just yeah. get better at it. And then you'll be ready for a race. It's easier said than done. Cause I know well, myself and my mentality can sometimes really be a strong thing to change. Yeah. I mean, lifetime who owns Athlinks. Um, and so I've, I've been in these meetings with the lifetime events crew because we own Chicago triathlon and, and New York city triathlon and uh, a couple of races down in Miami. The, the shame of triathlon today it used to be every market had the splash and dash series or open water swim series, and they were cheap to put on and they were easy and they were cheap to enter. So when I started doing triathlons, I'm like you, I had, I had no swimming background whatsoever. First time I jumped in the pool, I did 50 meters and thought I was going to die. I mean, I was just flat exhausted at the end of 50 meters, I guess. Yeah. 50 meters, a 25 meter pool. I thought I was going to do about a half a mile. I went, to one end and back and pulled myself out of the water and said, well, I guess I'm not going to do a triathlon because that was freaking miserable. Um, and then over the course of the next month or so, I learned how to do it. But this developmental race style, splash and dashes and open water swims changed the world for me because for 20 or 25 bucks, I could go show up on a Thursday night and race four weeks in a row and learn this discipline of getting punched in the face while you're trying to swim. Interesting. Without yeah, without risking 150 bucks and all the pageantry and everything that goes into a triathlon, right? Or worse yet, $800 for an Ironman. And sure. in 2008, with the financial crash and municipalities getting squeezed, they raised the fees on all of those lake rentals and police and, you know, lifeguards and things. And it just gutted the sort of feeder system of triathlon around the country. And that's a shame. And that's so without triathlon, like anybody will go jump into a 5k, but to get to a triathlon, you need those, you need a support system around it to get people to go from, I can't swim, you know, I can't ride a bike, whatever. You need those other things around it to get people confident in those things. I, I truly agree. And uh, you're so right. Maybe this is something I need to uh, reassess. You do. Yeah, you do. And just register and do it. Oh man, it's, it's, they're so fun. I haven't done one since I moved it. Well, I guess I, I did Chicago since I've moved um, to Colorado, but I don't, I don't enjoy swimming at, at a mile high in cold water. It's not my thing. <laughs> so. Now, COVID-19 impacted <clears throat> everybody in 2020. I yeah. mean, for all of us, athletes, non-athletes, it impacted everybody in 2020. It was really bad. How devastating was it for you seeing all these races canceled? Well, I think it, it, um, I mean, the easy answer is it was absolutely devastating. The, the worst part about it is over the 20 or 15 years that I've been around this industry, you just make a lot of friends. And <clears throat> so let's start with the industry first. Okay. We going through uh, March, the first week of March, based on the number of finishers, 
the industry was up 3%. It was the first time we'd been up since 12, uh, 2012. So we were actually, this was going to be um, a good year for endurance racing based on participants. Since then, so not even since then, immediately once the lockdown happened, 94% loss in terms of number of finishers. So you know, there were some markets that were still having some bigger races. They figured it out earlier. Maybe they were just getting in under the, under the radar. And so when I look at, you know, all of the friends that I've made who are timers, who are, you know, make medals, who make t-shirts, who are race directors, their livelihood 100% is now gone, just up in smoke, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and that's really, really tough <clears throat> to watch. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the PPP loans and things like that helped. But when I'm, you know, talking to people, you know, contemplating laying off their entire staffs, contemplating this business that they have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into over the years. And they're just saying, you know, we don't know what to do. Like we're going to, because there wasn't def anything definitive at the time either. If, you know, you remember, it wasn't like they said, okay, we're going to shut down for one year. If you remember, it was like, well, we just need two weeks. Well, then two more weeks. Well, if we just do two more weeks and two, and it was just this like unknown. And then you just saw the races canceling. Yeah. So on that side, it was just, it really hit close to home. You know, we, we at Athlinks, we had to lay off um, a handful of people because we just, you know, the revenue wasn't there and, and you just have to, and especially being owned by Lifetime Fitness, those clubs shut down. So the parent company then had to start saving cash and just saying, look, you know, if we, you know, mission today is make sure there's a business to come back to, um, exactly. which was the right call, right? Um, and so there's that. And then you throw in all of the, just the mental side of, you know, the, the joy, the escape, the release, all the things that racing brings to you and me, to athletes who just want to cross a finish line, who just want to train, who, you know, uh, it's the, it's the reason we all recreate in general. Maybe you hate your job, you hate your wife, you hate your kids, whatever it is, but racing is a thing that just, you know, it's that moment of escapism that just gets you, um, gets you away from your life, or it puts you closer to your life, or you know, it, whatever. It, we all get something different out of racing. Yeah, um, exercise is good, training's better, but racing is really the thing that that it's that it holds that mirror up. And when you lose that, and you no longer have that way of testing yourself and proving yourself at the same time that your world is crumbling around you and those of your family and, you know, people are dying and things like that. It's, it's tough. Very true. Now, some like, like yourself, athletes and many other organizations, you know, they took a big hit Yeah. You know, in 2020 and some even now in 2021 and organizations, businesses had to look at change and pivot their, their paths in order to be successful and to get some sort of cash coming in. Yeah. Now, for example, a good example would be creating virtual races. Yep. So what were your thoughts regarding virtual racing during the mm. pandemic still? Yeah. Uh, I mean, easy, easy answer is it's a necessary evil. You know, I don't like virtual races just personally. So take athletes out of this as an, as a, as an athlete, as a somewhat of a purist, uh, there's just something different about it. You know, it's, it's, yeah. and frankly, like I, this to me goes back to much, much deeper. It's kind of like when you have these massive staggered starts in races, I want to know who I'm racing against, you yeah. know? So like in triathlon, you typically go off with your age group. And so, you know, I'm not necessarily racing against, um, a female in a different age group. I'm racing against the, you know, male 45 to 49 uh, currently. And so like, that's the, that's come like my baseline, I guess. So then when you get into virtual, it's like, okay, you know, like I'm not really racing somebody. Um, I love what it did to the industry. So it did put cash back in the hands of race directors, you know, it was, but it was more of like a GoFundMe in a lot of ways. Um, and, yeah. and and we have heard from, we just did a, 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 an email to all of our members um, a couple of weeks ago and asked them like, what have you done to stay sane during COVID? And I think we had like a, a hundred or so responses. And I would say 80% of them said virtual races. So I don't, 
I don't want to take anything away from those who really gained a lot from them. For me, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, what I love about what virtual race has represented this year from a technology standpoint is this is the best time to be in, um, in a, in an innovator's seat, meaning, you know, every year you have roadmaps, you have things that you want to build, you have people that you want to build them for, but we were all so busy working on the events. You know, there really is no reprieve in this industry. There's Christmas, you get a little bit of a break, but even Christmas day, you have all these Santa runs, you know, the biggest race days of the year, July 4th in America and Thanksgiving. Um, and, and it varies around the country or in the, around the world, but there just is no big three, four, five month gap where you get to sort of re uh, um, configure your roadmaps. Well, in the last year and a half or year, certainly, now is the time like the, you know, when you tear, when you tear an industry down to its, it, to its foundation and Spartan's a great example of this with the, the Spartan games and different things that they've done is you get to reimagine like, what should this industry look like coming back? And you get to yeah. be part of the shaping of that. Yeah. And so, um, so what virtual did, because every race director is always asked for some virtual component. You know, whether it was like during after 9-11, you had, I think it was New York, had a contingent of like Marines and, and Army, you know, military on bases in Iraq who would run the New York City Marathon virtually. But nobody built part of the platform around that. And then when COVID hit, like within 30 days, every single major platform out there had a virtual race component. So it it yeah. it it applies that innovation innovative pressure on the on the innovators to to do something new. That's a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's no well put. Thank you. Now you, Troy, you're the founder and president of Athlinks for more than a decade. Yeah, um, Athlinks yeah. has been an instrumental part in in in, in an athlete's um, I guess for the athletes period of time. For me, it's been since 2014. That I've been using athletes. Nice. Wow. That's great. Loved it. Um, it's also one of the largest racing databases that I know of. So oh, it's far and away the largest. Yeah. I, uh, not to toot the horn, but yeah, it's far and away the largest. We are, we have 350 million race results in the platform. I don't think there's really even a close second as far as that goes. Yeah. So yeah. talk to me about the history of athletes and how did this come to be? I know that you mentioned in the beginning a yeah. little bit, but if you can talk to us about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, it was just that it was, it was sort of built as a, I wasn't even racing at the time that I had the idea and I came up with it again. I was a software developer and <clears throat> was just trying to solve a problem initially around, again, this, it wasn't called FKT at the time, but it was, I would do these, you know, it, they were mainly like mountain hikes and runs uh, like Camelback mountain and South mountain in Phoenix. And I just always wondered what everybody else was running, like what times were people running to the top of um, Camelback Mountain, let's say. And so I built it and that was that was the version that was called Virtue Race. And again, you would virtually race against each other um, in this in that regard. And so for, for, for about a month and a half, every single morning, so literally Monday through Sunday, every single day, um, I would climb Camelback Mountain and I would hand out these little activation cards to people and say, hey, you know, if you're, if you're wondering what other people ran, you know, go log in, it's free, go post your time. And I think in a month and a half, like two people did it. It was a miserable total failure. <laughs> Nobody understood it or didn't want it or need it or whatever. And, um, and I was on my way home, for those of you who, from Phoenix, any of your listeners, um, you know, you drive from Camelback into Chandler, you drive right by Tempe Town Lake, which is where Ironman and all the, mainly all the triathlons are held in, in Tempe. And there was a triathlon going on. And I was always kind of fascinated by triathlon. I'd never done one at this point. And I just happened to stop and talk to some athletes about like, how do you, like, how does this all work? How do you get your results? And, you know, that type of thing. And the funny thing was it happened to be an ITU race. So I had a bunch of pros from other countries and places. And so they, they were, they were very dismissive of the idea of like, they didn't even know the name of the race. They had just kind of showed up because their, you know, their team or whatever 
put them there. And so they told me this kind of abysmal story of like, I don't know, like we'll look at our results tapped to that tree over there, but beyond that, we don't know how to get them. Um, oh. And so the reality was probably something a little bit more formal, but not much at the time. You know, they had been uploaded to active or cool running or something like that. And so I literally went home that night and I started revamping the, the virtue race engine so that instead of individuals putting the results in, we could just upload a file and it would parse everything out. Okay. And then the next weekend I went to a 5k, handed out those same cards and said, Hey, your results will be available at virtue race. And even that it was so much easier to say, it was just like, your results will be available at virtue race, you know, just handing out these cards. And by the time I got home after that race, like 50 people had signed up to get their results that way. I, I didn't even talk to the race director. <laughs> I just said it. And then I had to go find the results and upload them in. But like 50 people signed up to pull their race results. And then, you know, like I just handled Phoenix for a little while and then somebody went and raced the LA Marathon. And then they, they emailed saying, hey, can you put in the LA Marathon results? And then by the way, you're, you know, I have the, like these 10 other results. Can you add those? And and so I just like, oh shit. And then, you know, um, it was a matter of like manually just uploading all of these results. And then I got some yeah. other people involved and, you know, kind of interned it and did some different things like that. And uh, yeah, it just, it, it took off. Like it was just an idea that, um, you know, there was just a really clear market and market need for yeah. it. And, you know. Well, yeah. there was, I told you, so I've been using it since 2014. Um, and what I truly love about this platform, about Athlinks, is that it allows me to track my results. But the best thing about it is that I'm also able to track other competitors or yeah. other, other racers and see where they're at and how I can tweak my training in order to be able to perform better. I love that. Yeah. It's one of the best things that I love about <laughs> Athlinks. So for, the, those, for those that don't know, not aware of athletes and their athletes themselves. Talk to us about these great features and these services mm -hmm. that you offer and you would offer people when they register to athletes. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the, the premise of athletes is that we, we upload as far as, you know, as far as we can gather the, you know, every, every race that happens that is timed that has results is eligible to be on athletes, whether we pick them up or not is, is a different story. We, we feel like we have, you know, better than 90% coverage around the world of all the races. And then, so the idea is that you go there to athlinks.com, you type in your name and we will give you back, here are all the results that, you know, match your name. And so if you have a John Smith type name, you're going to have to do a little bit of work to weed those out. And, you know, you can filter it out by date, you know, like age and things like that. But okay. <clears throat> So then you go claim your results, meaning you just go grab them and save them to a newly created free profile. And then from your profile, you can then start to follow other athletes. So we have a we have a feature called Rivals, which I think you're probably familiar with, which is we show you of everybody that you follow, we show you your win loss record against each of those athletes, time differentials, and things like that. Um, uh, the the we used to have a feature. You know, this is the this is one of the consequences of selling a business is you, you do tend to lose a little bit of control over the roadmap. And so when we sold the lifetime who also bought chrono track at the same time, okay. a, lot, a lot of the focus went into what you see today in terms of live results. So I'm sure your audience is very familiar with both the chrono track and athletics yeah. brands from a Spartan and, you know, battle frog and different OCR um, races where we provide live results, map tracking and all that stuff. But we kind of got away from the more athlete centric functionality. So it used to be, um, and we hope to build this back in one day, um, is like I could look at a set of results and everybody that is one of my friends was, um, had a little red icon next to it, or a, sorry, a, every rival had a red icon, every friend had a green icon. Um, if I looked at your results, then like every mutual race we had done together had like an, you know, red underline. So there was some yeah. color coding on the site that was really rich that showed you like all the relationships as you're clicking through. And wow. Yeah. So, yeah. so we just, we had to gut some of those things to simplify the code base, you know, um, so that we could sort of make way for coming back. And that's frankly what we did 
most of COVID was rebuild the platform. So you're going to see as races come back, Athlinks is a lot faster. It is a lot um, easier to deal with in terms of claiming those results. And um, uh, yeah, we've made some really nice enhancements to the platform in the last 12 months. That is truly awesome. Everybody yeah. register. <laughs> yeah, you're going to love that. it. You're going to benefit from it. I mean, I do. I use it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, myself and many other people are thankful that Athlinks exists. So thanks, that. Troy. Yeah, <laughs> now, very much appreciated. What do you think is the mood of the runners uh, now in 2021? I think, yeah, I think it's split. I think I do a lot of trail running here in Boulder. <clears throat> and I would say 70 to 80% of the people that I run past if there are not already wearing a mask, they pull a neck buff up over their face, which to me is surprising. Um, you know, you're outside, you're on a 20 foot wide service road. And I, I worry that those are not people that are going to come back to racing anytime soon. So that's part of it. That's, that's sort of one half on the other side. Um, so this past weekend, Shamrock shuffle, uh, JNA racing up in Virginia, uh, just happened. It's normally a 30,000 person race. I think they had four or 5,000 this year, but four or 5,000 incredibly, uh, um, exuberant people ran that race this past weekend. So I think that the demand has never been higher, obviously. Um, if you look at bike retail and run retail, like they have exploded in the last 12 months. Um, and like my gym, I go to a lifetime here in, in, um, in Broomfield, Colorado, I couldn't find a parking spot last night. So like people are slowly starting to emerge, you know? <laughs> So I think we'll come back. I think it's going to take a little while, obviously, yeah. to to get back all the way up. I think the um, the appetite for change is there as well. So yeah. and I explained that some of that on the technology side of things. We've seen some really cool, innovative things with like Grinduro and Enduro style scoring where you don't necessarily... So picture a Spartan race. There are what... 20% of the people in a Spartan race are really going for time. Maybe 10% are really going like hardcore. I want to know exactly where I stand up. Yeah. Then you have a lot of other people who would maybe love to just take their time and just don't necessarily care about the time. They just want the experience. Yeah. And so something like Grinduro, where on a hundred mile bike course, let's say you only time 20 of those miles and they're broken up into different uphill segments, downhill segments, things like that, where you can space the athletes out quite a bit um, and make it more of a day. I mean, what better experience than going to a Spartan and being there all day because you're racing in segments, you know what I mean? Like you don't, it's not just like an hour and you're done and then you go and, and you get back in your car and you leave, but you know, it's like, okay, you make the courses a little bit harder you make them a little bit more social so that you're saying, okay, you know, Juan Carlos, let's like you and me, let's go race up this hill. We do that. And then we'll take 10 minutes to rest and, and chill out. So I think that there's yeah. some innovation. And I'm not saying Spartan's working on this, by the way, I'm just saying that there are, there are a lot of races out there that are doing these modified timing rules that I think could really change a lot of the experiential side and bring new people to racing who like yourself in a triathlon, are maybe a little bit worried about, oh, I can't do the swim or I can't yeah. throw a spear. Or I can't, you know, whatever. Um, I can throw a spear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oddly, I'm embarrassed to say this. I've never done a Spartan. Joe's going to kill me. I've never, for whatever, I've been good friends with Joe for years and years. We've done all the technology for, um, for Spartan for years. And like, if I've gone to a Spartan race, I'm, I'm either working it or I'm, you know, having, like I'm talking to Joe or Jeff or somebody, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, it, it, for whatever reason, I've never done one. No, no good excuse. I've always wanted to. And, and I just, I know. Done. How is it that you're friends with Joe the same that? Yeah. But yet you haven't done an OCR race. I don't know. I don't know. I'm embarrassed to admit it. You shouldn't have said it at all. <laughs> well, it's you, you could go to my Applings profile and wonder, <laughs> wonder what's, what's missing. Okay. Yeah, I don't so, I don't know why. Okay, so here's a question for you. <clears throat> yes, sir. What do you got on the horizon for 2021 uh for running? And with 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 the running, are you gonna add in a Spartan race? 
So the uh, I won't do Spartan in 2021. I I, um, I detached my bicep in November in oh. judo. Yeah, and so I had surgery, uh, recovering great and all that stuff. Yep. But I have to be really careful of anything that'll like I can lift right now, and especially with the bands. But anything that that I could like you know, like the monkey bar types of things where I'd be twisting on it um, is really dangerous. Yeah. So I I just need to give it. I want to give it a full year to heal and bake in. Okay. Yep. So nothing nothing that's bad. different. Yeah, uh, indeed. Yeah. Take so, the year off. <laughs> so, um, so as I said, Silver Rush 50 mile run. Uh, so I'll probably do Leadville Marathon or Heavy Half in June, and then Silver Rush 50 mile run in July. Um, I may do the Havilene 100K in Phoenix later. I think that's November, which is also when cyclocross season starts. So I'll do cyclocross in the fall. Yeah. Um, and then I'll probably throw in whether it's Breck Epic or Steamboat or a couple of mountain bike races along the way. I've kind of gotten to an age now where I want to race like three times a year, but make them really kind of epic races, yeah. bigger, you know, uh, just, you know, bolder types of, uh, yeah, not Boulder, Colorado, but bold, you know, yeah. uh, races and just like great experiences. So races like Breck Epic, multi-day races through Breckenridge and things like that. Just really your, yeah. Leadville Marathon is a race that is really well known. Um, I heard of it through Mark Macy and Travis Macy. I don't know if you're aware of, I'm sure you know who they are. Um, I know the names, I've never met them. Um Mark Macy is a legend when it comes to adventure racing. Okay. Uh, they were part of the um, world's toughest uh, adventure race up in Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that's how I know about Leadville, and a few other uh, athletes have mentioned it before. And so I know that I'm going to be making my way down to Colorado sometime soon, uh, hopefully okay. this year, to go and hang out with, um, with Vinny. Um, Vinny Jones, uh, he's one of the OCR athletes to go there and, and uh, run down there. Well, you'll, you will love Leadville. And you, you asked like what my best race was. Probably my best, the race I was most proudest of, most proud of, was uh, Leadville Heavy Half. So Leadville Heavy Half is a weird race. You start downtown Leadville and then you run up to the top of Mosquito Pass, which is... Leadville's at what, 10,000, 10,200 feet. And then you run to the top of Mosquito, which is about 13.5, I think, 13.8. So it's a 15.5 mile out and back. Oh, wow. Okay? So it's a short, it's, it's, that's what they call it a heavy half. It's just a little bit bigger than a, than a half marathon, but it is, it's a, I mean, it's a pant shitter. Like it's, it is a hard, getting to the top of Mosquito is no, you know, it's, it's a tough one, especially if you're, you know, going for it. Oh, so wow. to speak. And, wow. um, well, so I was really worried because I talked to a lot of people who've gotten really bad, uh, altitude sickness once you get up above the tree line. Cause you literally, like, as you're running this course, you start in this forest and then you come out of the forest and all of a sudden the trees just stop. I mean, it's like, you know, like the trees can't grow above this line where there's not enough oxygen. So, um, uh, so I took it super easy, probably too easy. And I got to the top of mosquito feeling super fresh. And then it was just an eight mile. I mean, like fell running for eight, eight miles. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. I did like a two fifty two um, <laughs> on that course, which was a, that was a good time for me. So I was, that was, that was the one I was most proud of. And then the next year I came in with all this hubris thinking like, Oh, I got this made. And I just absolutely bonked. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was my worst race probably ever. That was the only race I've ever considered DNFing in oh, and wow. myself off course. Yeah. It was, it was awful. I was just, I was cramping up. I was running down the mountain, like Frankenstein, like my <laughs> legs were stiff. My arms were stiff. <laughs> I had a bloody hat because I fell down and cut my hands up and I like tried oh. to adjust my hat. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's the race for you. <clears throat> bad day. Bad day. Yeah, but it was good. Really you know, bad. You um, learn from days like that. Troy, so you're not only the founder and president of Athletics, you also run a podcast where you interview with athletes around the world. I do. Talk to us about that. That's been actually the thing that... Um, wanted to do a podcast for a long time. And in fact, 
started sponsoring um, IM Talk. It used to be called Iron Man Talk. Uh, it's IM Talk now. It's John and Bevan out of New Zealand. Great guys, just phenomenal guys. And they do a, in a in an insanely good podcast. And what scared me off actually was how good their podcast is. It's very structured. They have these like race reports and all the, and I was like for years, I was like, I can't, I just don't have time to put that type of thing together. And so I never did one for years. And I, I, um, it was a weird, it was a weird kind of um, route that happened. It was right around the time mid last year, or the, I guess the year, whenever, shoot, I don't know, my years are all bleeding into one another. Um, it must've been last year. So it was the, there was like three women in a row attacked out on runs and killed. Um, the gal in, in Texas, uh, I, I don't Florida, Texas, and somewhere else down South. Um, and so we put this like video, um, it was prepared and aware. And we, we made this video and it was all about situational awareness and things. And we never released it. It didn't, frankly, like I, we never even finished the video of it. But as part of that, a buddy of mine, Todd Straka, who is the Boulder runner on Instagram, he came out that day. And then since I had this camera crew and stuff, we just filmed me interviewing him. And I loved it. I was like, oh man. Like, could it be this easy where I'm just talking to another athlete about, you know, like what makes them tick? And so Todd was the first uh, episode of the podcast. And then, yeah, like the next day I bought a mic and some stuff and started doing it. And I just, I absolutely love it. You know, it is, um, it has been one of the things that has kind of uh, given me some sanity, I think, in the, in the past year. So we started at November. Um, at one point, I was doing three episodes a week, which like smashed me. But I needed I needed the distraction. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So now we're we're back down to one a week, and it's a little bit more manageable. But yeah, I'm loving it. I I, I have a blast doing it. Yeah, I can agree. Yeah, I can definitely and the, agree. And the people that I've met, like yourself, and you know, I mean, like again, Jason Hardrath and Ashley Winchester on the FKT side, Latoya Snell, Roderick. So like, there's just these stories that I get to these conversations I get to have week in and week yes. out. You're just like, holy shit. Like it makes you feel very small, you know? Exactly. Yeah. But you're also grateful and thankful that you get oh. to hear these stories and be able to totally. share them with everybody. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it is, um, it's cool because, you know, you see the sort of glossed over version. Um, the nice thing with this format is, like I, I loved one of my favorite things ever was watching the the Iron Man coverage on NBC growing up, but it was always so. Even like you mentioned that um, the uh, the Eco Challenge in in Fiji, like you, yes, you 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 get enamored with a story, but you only get like four minutes of it. You know, you're like, oh, but I want to know more about that. So being able to sit down and talk to somebody for an hour or an hour and a half or even longer about all the things that went into that great little four minute segment, you know, yeah. uh, is fantastic. I love it. I love being able to have those conversations. I love being able to bring that conversation to people. I love the feedback and the, you know, the positive reinforcement that you get from it. It's, it's fantastic. It truly is. Yeah. And, you know, add to that, I, I've been blessed to have so many amazing athletes and, on this show and be able to interview them and get to know them but to, 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 like like we said it's the stories yeah just it's amazing that you get to hear all these stories and be able to share it with the world yeah and, and bridge people together yeah connect yeah. strengthen the communities i truly love that yeah i i the, the thing that is cool i've always been i i have always really enjoyed um for lack of a better word, like political debate, but I'll just call it discourse. So just conversations, you know, I love sitting down with people who feel and think totally differently than I do and having a civil discussion around that topic. Yeah. And we've lost that. We have just, we have lost that ability to just have a rational civil discussion 
on whatever the topic is. And I love the fact that I can, um, you know, you have to be careful, obviously. You don't, I, it, it's a running podcast at the end of the day or cycling or, you know, an endurance podcast. So I, I tend not to want to go into the political side of things, but yeah. I love being able to talk to people from different countries, different walks of life, different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds and everything and have this common experience of racing and how that fits in with their life and their, you know, their, their sort of, uh, you know, um, their own experience of growing up and life and, you know, just how those things play out and why, how it's different from my experience. And, you know, they're educating me on things that I didn't understand perhaps, and, and maybe vice versa. But um, that is one thing that I do like about it is it is, it's a, it's a common ground that then we can have other conversations from. And if, and when they do get a little tense, we can go back, you know, we can go back into racing. We can, you know, it's like, okay, we can kind of dip our toe into that water of, you know. Um, it's true. And I do agree with, you know, I, I believe in that organic conversation with somebody. I want to treat everybody that comes in here like as if I'm talking to a friend yeah. and not have a scripted. I don't have nothing scripted for this episode. Uh, I may have key points that will help me in order to be able to ask the question, but I don't have nothing scripted. If anything, I want everything to be organic and just have a nice, calm and, and relaxed conversation with, with another person, with a friend or with an athlete or whoever it is. Yeah. 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 Likewise. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I don't know, the, just racing is, um, I'm sure if I dug into, you know, any sort of hobby style thing, you have all sorts of backgrounds represented, but racing is truly like the yes. people that you see out there of different backgrounds, different um, athletic abilities, different, just, I don't know. It, it's such a, it's such a phenomenal world um, of athletes and experiences. And, and that's what, you know, I mean, I love race morning. I love as much as I hate it. Like I hate everything about it is the reality. I hate waking up early. Can't stand it. I hate, you know, like getting to some place in the dark and you're trying to, you know, get your bearings and you've got that anxiety. I hate the feeling of anxiety and butterflies on the start line. I hate when I jump into water in a, in a triathlon, it's freezing <laughs> I hate when I'm on an open water swim and I'm getting punched in the face and um, my body's tightening up and I'm like, shit, I, you know, and I got a breaststroke and I'm losing it. <laughs> and then I hate on the bike that I'm not as fast as I want to be. And, you know, like I'm getting, I'm getting chicked left and right. You know, these women just blowing past me. I'm you know, like, what the hell? And then I hate when I run and my legs are dead and I can't, but then when I cross that finish line, every single time, you're just like, fuck you. Like, when's my next race? You know, yep. yes, I think yeah. a lot of people were would relate and agree. Yeah, there's nothing I like about it except for all of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything that you would like to mention? Do you have anything on the horizon for that links? Any special projects in 2021 that you got coming up? You want to? Well, you would like the, to share with us? Yeah, we'll get some late breaking news on here. The guys <laughs> at Spartan know this, but um, I'm actually leaving Athlinks. So I, uh, the company that I founded and and have been, it has been my baby for 15 years. Um, I will be, I will be sort of still, you know, sort of around as an advisor, but I'm, I'm ready for some, <clears throat> some new challenges in my life. So. Uh, more on that to follow. I will be continuing the podcast, uh, whether it stays Athlinks or sponsored by or brought to you by Athlinks. Um, the podcast will will remain the same, but um, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely going to do the the podcast. And again, I think you're going to see some good stuff out of Athlinks. It is, it for me personally, it's just sort of run a, a you know a 15 year course. I'm again, I'm turning 50 this year and kind of time to, this has been the, wow. the plan for a couple of years has been to now kind of move on to the next uh, group of challenges and start using all those skills that I've learned over the last 15 years to the next thing. Wow. Yeah. If people wanted to communicate with you, reach out to you, you know, get in contact with you, yeah. how can they do that? Uh, Instagram or email are probably the two best ways. So Instagram, I am Troy uh, at Troy Busso, T-R-O-Y-B-U-S-O-T. Um, and then my email is similar. It's Troy at Busso.com. And one more question. What piece of advice would you give to the young 
runners or OCR athletes that want to come into the sport or already in the sport and they want to elevate to the next level, what piece of advice would you give them? Uh, I, for business, life, endurance, anything is always be coachable. Understand that you don't know it all, that you're half wrong at least. Yeah. Um, and just be coachable and, and, and always seek out that knowledge and understanding from people who have, you know, more knowledge and more experience than you. I've, I've, I have lost more money and time and everything in my life by not being coachable at times by, by assuming that I had everything sort of dialed in. Uh, so yeah, I will say that's the, the number one bit of advice that I can give to anybody is, is seek, seek, uh, more information, more experience, more coaching, you know, whatever you want to call that thing. Of course. Um, and uh, yeah, get, get that. Troy, it's been such a true pleasure to speak with you, to learn, and just, you know what, you are truly inspiring. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, man, I appreciate that. Um, I hope that you recover from the injury. And 100%. that way you can go get out there and not only run, but go do an OCR race and let Joe DeSena know. <laughs> Indeed. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, for sure, you need to come down here to Colorado. We'll do I can't wait together. And then if there is a, I think there's like, uh, I know there's Brack. There's I think Bre Beaver Creek. There, yeah. So there's a few, a few Spartans that we can jump into. So if you're down here at a time, I will absolutely join you for a Spartan. If not, then we'll do I, some trail running up in Leadville. Or I will take you up on that. Don't awesome. you forget that. I will I will definitely be knocking on your door or send you an email before I knock on that door. Perfect. Yeah, for, everybody listen, for everybody that's listening and watching, of course, I hope you guys learned as much as I have. Um, he is truly inspirational. Reach out to him. Ask him any questions you may, uh, you may have. Troy, once again, thank you for making the time to speak with me today. Oh, thanks for reaching out. Really, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. So I appreciate you having me. Great. Everybody take care. Troy, take care of yourself. Likewise.